lecture of the 2020-2021 Perimeter Institute Public Lecture Series. My name is Greg Dick. I'm the Senior Director of Advancement and Public Engagement here at Perimeter Institute. It has been a strange few months with many new protocols and adaptations in our daily lives, so we are excited to be able to create a pocket of normalcy as we begin another terrific season of public lectures. Whether you're a longtime viewer or a first-time guest, thank you for joining us tonight. Before we begin the evening, in the spirit of understanding and learning from what has come before, Perimeter respectfully acknowledges that we are located on the traditional territory of the Atawandran, the Ashinaabeg, and the Haudenosaunee peoples. Perimeter is situated on the Haldeman Tract, land promised to six nations, which includes six miles on each side of the Grand River. The public lecture series is Perimeter's longest running public outreach program. Perimeter is a not-for-profit organization, and these public science events are part of our commitment to sharing exceptional, engaging science. I encourage you to join the conversation online. We are at Perimeter, and you can use the hashtag PILive to chat with Perimeter scientists and to ask questions of tonight's guest speakers. Causal inference is a new area of science that is emerging rapidly and appears crucial to advancing quantum physics. Tonight, we are joined by Perimeter Institute faculty, Robert Speckens, and Perimeter Institute research associate, Ellie Wolf. Dr. Speckens, a Perimeter faculty member since 2008, received his Bachelor of Science in Physics and Philosophy from McGill University, and completed his Master's and PhD in Physics at the University of Toronto. He held postdoctoral fellowship, fellowships at Perimeter, and at the International Royal Society Fellowship at the University of Cambridge. Dr. Ali Wolf, a research associate at Perimeter since 20, 2014, received his Bachelor of Arts in Physics from Yeshiva University in Manhattan and received his PhD in Physics from the University of Connecticut. Tonight, we will hear about the development of leading edge algorithms and the fundamental scientific discoveries that will advance quantum physics and have the potential to impact across all fields of science uncovering the, causal, the complex causal mechanisms that are key to genuine understanding. Dr. Speckens and Dr. Wolf are part of a team of researchers at Perimeter who are making substantial new contributions to the study of causation. Their team has introduced a new technique that is helping to unravel part of that causal complexity woven into the foundations of so many fields. Tonight's lecture will be a dynamic presentation as Dr. Speckens and Dr. Wolf share their collective insights together. After their presentations, we will dive into a Q&A session, and I am committed to getting to as many online questions as possible. So please, use, use the hashtag PILive and send them in throughout the evening. In order to deliver the best possible quality for the presentation, our incredible AV team has set us, set us up right here in the perimeter building at socially distanced locations. They have me comfortably situated in a temporary studio just beside the Mike Lazaridis Theatre of Ideas, surrounded by screens that will let me see both of our speakers, the live feed that you're seeing, and your stream of questions. So let's welcome Dr. Robert Speckens and Dr. Ellie Wolf as they explain this new area of science and how their unique skills and experience as quantum physicists are leading them to become causal detectives. Gentlemen, hello, how are you and, and where are you? Hi Greg, uh, yeah, I'm doing well, thanks. Uh, I have been set up in the comfort of my very own office at Perimeter um, and I'm particularly happy because uh, I've been reunited with my floor to ceiling blackboard which extends across a whole wall of the office, st standard issue in all the, the researchers offices at, at Perimeter. Uh, and it, it's a bit strange because it still has the calculation on it during the, the last meeting, in-person meeting I had with a student way back in, in March. Um, of course, the research and the meetings with students have continued uh, over Zoom and online, uh, but I, I do miss the, uh, the in-person meetings and the Blackboard, of course. Excellent. And Ellie? Hi, Greg. I am in a collaboration space within the building. For viewers who have not yet been to Perimeter, the building architecture is designed from the ground up to promote collaboration. So while the offices are beautiful and have floor to ceiling blackboards, there are lots of these small collaboration spaces scattered throughout the building that promote collaboration also with blackboards, often with couches, sometimes with wood burning fireplaces. <laughs> and I'm in one of those collaboration spaces. Gentlemen, it's so good to have you here. Thank you for being willing to share with us and our online audience. Why don't we get started? 
Right. OK, so I'm going to tell you a bit today about two fields of research. The, the first is a field called causal inference. Uh, it's a subfield of machine learning. And uh, it's practiced uh, by many different scientists, but in particular computer scientists and statisticians. And the second field is quantum physics, and in particular the foundations of quantum theory, uh, which is where Ellie and I uh, have our expertise. So uh, we're going to tell you a little bit about what causal inference is, what sorts of problems uh, it can solve, uh, and uh, how it informs research in quantum physics today, and furthermore, how progress in, in quantum physics and quantum researchers can also inform causal inference. OK, so let's start with, with causal inference. Uh, perhaps the best way to think about what a causal inference researcher is is a kind of detective. So the, the evidence they have is statistical correlations. Uh, and what they're trying to figure out is a story about cause and effect that accounts for those statistical correlations. So I'm going to give you a few examples so that you get a sense of, of uh, how that works. Uh, and so uh, let's just jump into the first example. Uh, so uh, imagine that you know, into the causal uh, detective agency, somebody comes uh, and, and they're interested in statistical data uh, which relates to the effectiveness of firefighters at, at reducing property damage. So they're, they're interested in knowing to what extent sending more firefighters could uh, uh, preserve uh, properties. And they have some confusing data. So, so they bring it to you. Uh, and here's uh, the data they have. They, they have uh, um, a number of different fires. Uh, so every data point on this graph is a fire. And uh, they know how many resources were committed to uh, fighting the fire. So for example, the number of firefighters who's, who showed up on the scene, and the amount of damage that was ultimately done by, by the fire. And so the strange thing is that they find this positive correlation here, uh, which says that the more firefighters that showed up, the more damage was done. Uh, so uh, you, you want to be careful interpreting that positive correlation in, in the wrong way. You know, naively, you might think, oh, uh, let's send fewer firefighters and less damage will be done. Uh, but day one of causal detective school, uh, you learn that correlation does not imply causation. Okay. So the, the very simple uh, explanation, wherein there's just this cause-effect relation between the number of firefighters and the amount of damage that's that's done uh, is, is quite implausible. And you go looking for a common cause explanation, uh, something that could account for it. And if you think a bit, you realize that there's an obvious one, which is the size of the fire. So there's variability in the size of the fire. And the size of the fire determines how many firefighters the dispatcher sends. So for small fires, they'll send only a few. And for large fires, they'll send more. And it also determines the amount of damage that's done. So it's very easy to explain the positive correlation in terms of this variation in the size of the fire. If you go back to the data and you stratify it by fire size, so you divide up the data points into different subsets that correspond to different sizes of fire, this is the kind of thing that you might see. So here are all the data points that correspond to the smallest type of fire. Here are all the data points, the next largest, all the way up to the biggest fires. Uh, and what you see is that as you vary across fire sizes, both the number of firefighters and the amount of damage done increases. And that accounts for the positive correlation that you see. Um, if you now look at just a particular size of fire, so you, you maybe pick out a, a subset of this data corresponding to a particular fire size, you find that now the correlation goes in the opposite direction. It's a negative correlation. So there's still variability in the number of firefighters who show up to fight a, a given size of fire. Uh, but now the more you send, the less damage that's done, which is what you expect, the, the intuitive result. And if you look at the slope of this curve, you could extract out some uh, sense of how uh, effective it is to commit more resources to, to a given fire. So case closed on, on this one. Let's, let's move on to the, the second example. Um, so this is going to be uh, an example involving the effectiveness of uh, a certain drug treatment on a particular medical condition. So you imagine that somebody comes to you with data uh, about uh, a population of people that have this condition, and some subpopulation of them have taken the drug, some subpopulation have not, and it records uh, how many have recovered and how many have not in those subpopulations. So imagine, for example, that this, this is what you have, that among uh, those who got the drug, 79% uh, recovered. Uh, whereas among those who didn't get the drug, only 43% recovered. 
So that's a pretty strong correlation between uh, taking the drug and, and recovering. Uh, and you, you might think, well, there's, there's nothing surprising uh, uh, going on here. Maybe it's just that the drug is very effective at promoting recovery. Unlike the firefighter example, there, there's nothing sort of bizarre about uh, imagining that this is all that's going on. But you know, day two of causal detective school tells you, you, you mustn't forget that correlation does not imply causation. So even if there's nothing surprising that clues you off to, you, know, you have to go looking for a common cause, you should still go looking for potential common causes that could explain the correlation instead of explaining it by cause and effect. And so if you think about it a little bit, you realize that uh, sure enough, there are, uh, there are lots of things that could do it. In particular, uh, personal factors such as being health conscious. So somebody who's health conscious might have a, a healthier lifestyle and be uh, more likely to recover from this condition uh, regardless. And they might also be somebody who's more likely to go and seek out uh, a new medication uh, and to, to take it. So that could account for some or all of, of the positive correlation uh, you see. Now the difference between the firefighter example and this one uh, that I want to highlight is that here I'm imagining that the data doesn't include this health consciousness factor. You can't divide up in the data uh, and stratify it by how health conscious different individuals are. So you just have the correlation and you don't know whether it's from the common cause or the cause effect. So you need a new trick. Um, uh, the causal detective's bag of tricks, uh, one of the, the most prominent tricks that you probably have already heard of is the randomized control trial. So the idea there is that you want to suspend the causal influence on taking the medication from, from any other factors that might influence recovery and replace it by something that won't have any common causes with recovery, like a coin flip. So the idea is that you find a population of people who have the condition and are willing to be part of your drug trial. And for every one of them, you flip a coin to decide whether they're going to get the medication or whether they're going to get a placebo. So obviously, the, the coin flip is not dependent on anything that recovery depends on. And now if you see correlation between taking uh, the medication and recovering, you can be uh, confident that it's not due to this common cause. It must be because the, the medication is effective. OK, so this works very well. The problem is that uh, randomized control trials have very limited applicability. Um, so for one, they're, they're very expensive to perform. Uh, but often, uh, you can't perform them. They may be unethical. You cannot make people smoke to see if they're uh, going to develop cancer. Uh, also, they compromise on, on the best possible outcomes. So if you have a, a, a treatment that uh, is very exciting and is extremely promising, you'd rather not uh, force half of the patients to take a placebo and not get the benefit of, of that treatment. Um, in some cases, it might just be impossible to intervene on the variables you're interested in. So in a, in a kind of extreme example, if I'm interested in statistical correlations between astrophysical variables that I'm looking at through my telescope, there's absolutely no possibility of changing any, any of those variables. Uh, so for all those reasons and, and others, uh, what we really want are tools that allow us to derive causal conclusions without doing these interventions, but rather from the natural experiment that's already been done, what's called observational data. So you would like to be able uh, to have you know, this situation going on in the world and somehow extract information about uh, this causal influence. So here's a, a, a trick that the causal inference community uh, has developed. Uh, it's to go finding what's called an instrumental variable. So an instrumental variable is something that influences the variable uh, you're interested in and is not influenced by this factor here, this common cause uh, of recovery. So in this example, uh, I'm using the idea that maybe uh, different countries, uh, uh, some countries do recommend this treatment and other countries uh, do not. Now, I know it's maybe a, a bit of a stretch to imagine that somebody in a position of authority who people look up to could recommend a treatment that in other countries might be considered uh, you know, not advantageous to health. But you know, bear with me. Imagine a possible world where that could have happened. And now if you see a positive correlation between the recommendation and the recovery, you know it can't be because of the common cause. So it has to be that variation in the recommendation led to variation in whether somebody took the medication or not, which is what led to the variation in the recovery. And this, therefore, there really is an influence of the medication on recovery. And you can uh, use the strength of those correlations to sort of back out what the strength of that causal influence is and answer the, the, the question you're interested in. OK, uh, third example. Uh, 
So this one is going to be uh, an example from economics, uh, and in particular, uh, the economics of education and uh, the connection between uh, getting a degree and uh, future wages. That's a kind of question that economists are interested in, whether uh, you know, the price of tuition is, is ultimately really worthwhile. So suppose you, you see a positive correlation there, too. And you might say, all right, well, that could be because the skills you acquired from that degree uh, ultimately set you up for a successful career. Uh, but you go looking for a, a common cause explanation. And sure enough, you know, there, there's uh, one ready for you, which is that maybe factors like aptitude or certain kinds of skill sets both uh, help you to get admitted and complete a degree and might also uh, be decisive in you know, how successful your career ultimately ends up being. So there's a plausible explanation of this positive correlation in terms of, of such a factor. And I'm going to imagine that, you know, that those factors are, are hidden. We, we don't have data on them. So same thing as, as the medical example. Again, we can look for an instrumental variable. So here, uh, I imagine that you know, there might be admission factors that are unrelated to aptitude. So uh, for example, uh, if, if uh, you come from a wealthy family that has made a donation to this institution, that might be sufficient to, to get you admittance. And if, if those sorts of factors correlate with uh, your future wages, you can be sure it's not by virtue of this common cause here. It must be because of this. Now what's different about this example compared to the last one is that for this example, there's a very plausible story uh, which has a direct influence from this variable over to here. Right? So this might not be a perfect instrumental variable. I could imagine that uh, you know, maybe my family connections, the position of my family, might have a direct influence on how lucrative my future career is, regardless of whether I went and, and got that degree or not. So uh, you might be worried about that, and, and therefore you can't quantify the, uh, the strength of the influence here in the way you would if there were no arrow. So you'd really like to know, do I need to worry about this uh, arrow or not? So we have another trick in the toolbox. Um, it turns out there's uh, constraints that follow from this causal structure on the sorts of correlations you can have between these three variables. So the joint probability distribution over these three uh, observed variables uh, can't be arbitrary. There's only a subset of, of possibilities. And there's something called instrumental inequalities, uh, which if they're satisfied by those distributions, uh, then they can be consistent with this structure. Um, so if you test your statistical data and you say, does it satisfy or violate those inequalities, and you find that they're violated, you know that it couldn't have been the original one. It, it must be something else. For example, this arrow must be there. So that could uh, clue you into the fact that, you know, that this is a real influence in this case, and I shouldn't analyze the data assuming it's not there. And I might be able to use something about the strength of the correlations the, or the amount by which I violate those inequalities to learn something about the strength of this influence and maybe back out uh, some estimates of what I'm really interested in. OK, so the, those were the, the three examples. Uh, and you'll notice there's a pattern. The pattern is that you have statistical data. That's your evidence. Uh, and you're looking for a story. You know, that's, uh, your, these are your suspects, right? So you have different possible causal structures. They're all suspects in the case. You want to know which of them does the best job of explaining what you've seen. And you might also want to know something about you know, the strength of particular uh, causal connections. OK, well, why is this important? Why, why do we want to answer these questions? Well, if you want to know how to act, uh, positive correlations are, are not what you're interested in. You're, you're interested in causal effectiveness. Uh, if I'm going to consider taking a new medical treatment for some condition, I want to know, is it causally effective? That's what ultimately determines my decision. When we do policy analysis, when we consider you know, a new economic policy, what will the impact be? We don't just want to know about correlations. We want to know that it was really causally effective. And ultimately, uh, most scientific questions are about getting down to a causal understanding, a story of, of what's really gone, not just uh, associations. OK, uh, if you're interested uh, in this topic, let me recommend for you a, a, a popular science book that came out a couple of years ago. It's called The Book of Why. Uh, uh, one of the authors of the book, Judea Pearl, is one of the founders of the field of causal inference uh, and one of the people who's done the, the most to uh, promote it and to develop new techniques. Uh, you could think of him as the Sherlock Holmes of causal detectives. All right, let's transition now into quantum theory. Um, so what does quantum theory have to do with causal inference? Um, so maybe I'll, I'll tell you sort of how I got into uh, working on causal inference. 
Um, so as you may know, there are a lot of conceptual puzzles in, in quantum theory, a, a lot of things that are very surprising and mysterious, different phenomena. Uh, and uh, as I uh, researched them, it seemed to me that uh, many of those puzzles uh, had the flavor of confusing correlation and causation. Uh, so when you confuse correlation and causation, things can uh, start to look uh, surprising and paradoxical. So it, it seemed to me that uh, some of that was going on in quantum theory. And so when about 10 years ago, I got wind of the existence of this field of causal inference, and I learned that they had uh, made a significant amount of progress disentangling correlation and causation in the classical context, I thought, well, it, it would be fun to see if the conceptual framework they had set up and some of the tools they had developed could help us understand some of the puzzling features of quantum theory. Uh, and it turned out that they, they really could, that in, in fact uh, these tools are extremely well suited to thinking about problems in quantum theory. Uh, and so uh, I've been very focused on, on, on these sorts of issues recently. And I would say my view of quantum theory these days has, has been completely transformed. And I really do take a, a very causal inference perspective on, on the topic now. Um, so I want to give you, uh, there, there are many examples of, of ways in which causal inference has impacted uh, our view of quantum theory. But I'm going to give you just one example. Um, and this example has to do with Bell's theorem. So this is uh, John Bell. His theorem is one of the uh, most fundamental results in the foundations of quantum theory. Uh, it's a result that really puts strong constraints on the, uh, your attitude towards what view of reality might be consistent with uh, quantum theory. All right, so let's see, uh, let's frame Bell's theorem from a causal inference perspective uh, as, a, as a case that the, the causal detective is uh, going to try to solve. Uh, so what does the statistical data look like in this case? Well, you've got an experiment, a, a simple experiment, where you have uh, two particles that are generated at the source. They go off to opposite wings. Uh, each one of them gets uh, measured. Uh, and one of two properties get measured. So I have a little knob here, the, the setting, which can be, say, 0 or 1. And that corresponds to which property I'm going to measure on that particle. And then there's a little LED light on top. And, and let's say those are also labeled 0 and 1 outcomes. Uh, and that tells me you know, wh whether the particle has that property or not. And I imagine repeating this experiment many, many times with uh, lots of pairs of particles, uh, doing random variations of the settings, and recording what outcomes I get on each side. And I get some data. So, so this is an example where if I look at the first row here, when the setting on the left and the right are both 0, uh, then the probability that the outcomes on the left and the right are both 0 is 43%. The probability that they're both 1 is 43%. And the rest of the probability is divided between the cases where, where they're not the same. And you have a similar pattern for, for the other uh, types of settings. So, so this is data that quantum theory predicts can happen in this experiment. And its uh, experiments have corroborated that. So there's experiments that, that show these kinds of correlations. OK, so, so what do we do with this? We ask the question of what's the causal story that can account for this statistical data? So I present to you suspect number one which is this causal structure here. So the, the idea is that there is a hidden common cause of the two outcomes, which explains their correlations. So the left outcome is just a function of you know, whatever property I'm measuring on the particle and the properties of the particles themselves. And we imagine that there's some variation in the properties of the particles as I uh, repeat this experiment. That's the idea of, of this causal story. And it's a very natural one, because if I look at the structure of the experiment, it really looks like there could be a mechanism here that uh, is a common cause that's going to influence the outcomes on both sides. So it's a, a completely plausible uh, picture of, of what might be going on. Now it turns out here in this uh, structure, like we saw before, there are not all distributions over these four observed variables are possible. There are constraints. Uh, and those constraints also come in the form of inequalities, and they're called Bell inequalities in, in honor of, of John Bell. Um, now, it turns out that these correlations that you observed do not satisfy those inequalities. They violate them. And when you see that, you know, therefore, that this causal structure is not compatible with what we've observed, and therefore, it's not this. This, this suspect is beyond suspicion. It's, it, it wasn't him. So you move on to your next suspect. OK, suspect number two. Uh, so many physicists have thought that uh, if you can't have the, the first explanation, that probably what's going on is something like this, a different causal structure. So uh, one example would be if there might be an influence from the setting on the left to the outcome uh, on the right. Uh, if you ask, well, what can I explain with that? Uh, you find that, yes, you can explain this, this data. So this is indeed compatible. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, many physicists have, have thought and, uh, that this is a very awkward and unnatural uh, explanation. 
There are, there are uh, several reasons that can be given for that. I'll, I'll mention one of them, which is that it's possible to do this experiment in a way that the time at which the setting on the left is chosen is, uh, and, and the outcome on the right is registered is such that even if an influence goes at the speed of light, it doesn't have time to reach the outcome to inform it what the setting was. And so to posit this structure is to posit that there must be causal influences that go faster than the speed of light. Uh, and that is in tension with Einstein's theory of relativity, which many people interpret as saying that no causal influence can go faster than light. So if you take that view of what's going on, you, you've got an uncomfortable tension between what are the two pillars of modern physics, quantum theory on the one hand and relativity. You don't want a tension between uh, those things. And so that's why uh, many people, uh, myself included, uh, are not happy with this, and so we say it. This is not uh, the right causal story either. Um, so I'm going to get to uh, the third suspect. You know, there, there are many others we can consider, but, but let me focus on this one. And this is one that really came out of taking the causal inference perspective on Bell's theorem. This is one of the dividends of thinking in a causal inference way. So the, the idea is that the structure is exactly like the, the one that Bell considered, the, the simple one where there's just a common cause. Uh, but what's, what's new and different here is that the nature of that common cause is, is not the same as it was classically. So in particular, the way the left outcome depends on its parents is not just a function of the setting and some variable that has some variability. This is no longer a variable. It's something more exotic. It's not a function that determines the dependence. It's a more exotic mathematical object. The uh, statistical variance here, or the uncertainty I have about this, is replaced by something that's a more exotic mathematical object. And I won't go into the details, but the idea is that it, it, it fits the, the rough structure of uh, a causal explanation. It's just that the notions of cause and effect and of statistical variance have been modified uh, in order. It, it, there's, it's, it's a bit how. In relativity, we space and time are still there, but they've been modified. It's a new notion of space and time. And it's a similar idea here that we have a, a what quantum mechanics asks us to do is have a, a new notion of, of cause-effect relations. So you can uh, devise such uh, models uh, such that they uh, reproduce the, the formal apparatus of quantum theory, and so they can generate these kinds of correlations. Uh, and so you can get compatibility between this structure and, and these correlations, and you can conclude that, yes, this, this is the right story. This is your man. Um, very good. Uh, so why is it important? Uh, I, I addressed that question in the, in the classical half. Uh, here I would say it's important because as I mentioned, you know, causal explanation is really central to science. Um, but furthermore, you know, more specifically, uh, one of the big unsolved problems in physics today is how to unify these, these two pillars on which modern physics rests, quantum theory and relativity. And it turns out that uh, Einstein's theory of, of space, time, and gravity is very much about potential causal connections. It's very much about causal structure. So if you uh, don't have a story about, you know, how do we generate these correlations that quantum theory predicts causally? If you don't know uh, what happens to the notions of cause effect in the quantum world, uh, you'll have a challenge in, in unifying these things. So I think that's, uh, I, I believe personally that uh, understanding cause effect in quantum theory is actually critical for uh, the, the progress of physics. All right, let me uh, wrap up and try to, to tie together these, uh, these two topics. Uh, Bell and, and Pearl. So remember the structure of that uh, Bell uh, causal uh, diagram. And now I've removed labels from these because I want you to imagine that these, these could be arbitrary. These, these could be variables from economics or medicine, or they could be settings and outcomes of experiments. It, it doesn't matter. In all cases, whatever it is, uh, if this is what's going on causally, there will be constraints on the sorts of correlations which are described by the Bell inequalities. And if you violate those constraints, you know it wasn't this structure. So what happens is that if you're a quantum physicist and you've done an experiment and you're confident because of relativity that this is the right causal structure, you conclude from that violation that you're witnessing some truly quantum effect, right? That uh, you've, you've managed to do the experiment uh, in a sufficiently subtle way that you can see quantum effects. Uh, if you're a classical causal person, however, and there's nothing quantum in your experiment at all, it's, it's just you know, uh, 
variables uh, from medicine or economics, you have a different conclusion. You see that violation, you say, aha, my hypothesis that this was the right causal structure is wrong. It must be something else. Maybe it's this one here with, with the arrow. So it's the same tool, right, these inequalities, used by both communities for, for different purposes, witnessing quantumness or, or just witnessing that your hypothesis was wrong. And it's the same thing with uh, what I described in the first half of the talk, this, this other structure called the instrumental structure. You have inequalities called instrumental inequalities that follow from that. And it's the same story, that if you violate those and you know it's not this, classically you'd go looking for some other connections. But you can also use it in quantum mechanics. If you've got an experiment that you're confident has this structure, you can say, ah, a violation of those inequalities tells me that my common cause must be quantum. And in fact, in the last few years, we now have experiments like this that uh, can witness the quantumness of the common cause for this kind of structure rather than Bell structure. So uh, to, uh, to wrap up, the, the point is that the, the plot of all these stories is basically the same, uh, much like in causal detective stories. Um, there are some variations in the quantum case, but the sorts of questions that are being asked the same, the concepts are the same, and a lot of the tools are common to the, to the two communities. So I'm going to pass it over to Ellie now to tell you a little bit more about that interplay and, and some of the applications. Ellie. Thanks so much, Rob. I, I really appreciate this introduction. And I want to uh, just recap uh, that what Rob has told us is sort of like how these two communities, quantum theorists and data scientists who are studying broad problems in causal inference, have an intersection. And I want to sort of pick up on that idea and extrapolate and explain why it's so interesting to quantum theorists not to just notice this connection, but to run with this connection. So let me just recap that Rob has explained to us, uh, if I can get the slides to advance, which they're not at the moment, I'm going to just step forward and see what I can do. There we go. So Rob has told us that Bell's theorem is a result which allows us to falsify a potential suspect as a causal explanation. This eliminating of a possible explanation is the fundamental premise in detective work. Sir Arthur Conan Doyle put the words in Sherlock Holmes' pages that once we eliminate the impossible, everything that remains, or whatever remains, can only be true. And here, causal inference is doing that kind of decision making. We have competing causal hypotheses, we have observable data, and we have to weigh them. We have to decide what is the real truth. And Bell's theorem is a result. And in retrospect, when we look back, we can say Bell's theorem is a result in the field of causal inference in 1964. Now, that's, of course, not how John Bell phrased it. But when we look back, we can say there has been this connection between the two communities of quantum foundations and data science, which we can trace back to that common result. Um, and so, this allows us to now get very excited about what we could do building on top of Bell's theorem. So John Bell himself looked at one particular class of diagram, a class of suspects which the inequalities that he derived allow us to rule out and find as signs of quantumness. But the truth is, in modern data science, the sorts of causal hypotheses and suspects that we're wrestling with are much more diverse. So here are just a few examples of causal structures from recent papers. Right? Here is a causal structure which pertains to dental hygiene and explores lots of pathways where sex and gender can impact tooth loss. And there's some nine different variables in this diagram. Here is a, uh, a similar causal structure applied in the field of agriculture, where we're trying to understand um, ecosystem dynamics. And there are various measures that we keep track of, and we posit that they're indicating underlying phenomena which interact in various ways. Um, and here is a highly complicated causal structure, but fairly par for the course in modern medicine, where we're looking at disease progression, drug treatment, inclusion in a study, risk of mortality, previous risk factors, understanding whether or not different interventions will alleviate other symptoms. And we're going to come back to these kind of complicated structures shortly. But this diversity of causal structures, which are relevant to practice, now begs the question, if John Bell has this result in quantum theory, which we understand as a result in causal inference, what about these more general causal suspects, these diagrams which have additional complexity? How should we approach those? And as quantum physicists, 
we turn to this and we say, okay, what was missing is generality. What we really want are tools which take Bell's 50 years of, of science which builds on that result and now extrapolates and allows us to take any causal structure, any diagram, and understand what are the constraints that this diagram implies. So that we can now go and say, if you hand me any possible diagram, I will be able to falsify it. I will be able to rule it out and say not this. How do we derive these inequalities? And this is some of the research that we're pursuing here at Perimeter, Rob and I. One of the results that um, I'm particularly proud that has come out of Perimeter is a uh, the inflation technique, is what we named it. I think this is one of the things that Greg referenced in the intro. In the intro. Um, and this allows us to take any causal structure, and it's a method for deriving constraints, which then allow us to perform falsification. So here, I'm giving an illustration of five different causal structures, which we apply the inflation technique to. So these are all diagrams, and I've removed all names, so these are highly abstract, but they're fundamental possibilities, which might be explanations for our data. But if we have inequalities associated with each one, then we can understand whether it is a valid explanation or if there are additional edges, then the extent to which it's not a good explanation gives us uh, back information about how strong and how important these additional edges, which are absent in these diagrams, must be in playing a role. And inflation, when applied to these, has given us inequalities heretofore unknown. So this is my first point. We say that quantum physicists have experience doing causal inference in retrospect, but moreover, today, quantum physicists are actively contributing to the field. We have results which are relevant for classical problems in causal inference, where we can do this kind of detective work. But even so, this whole notion is still just scratching the surface, because so far I've told you that quantum theorists have something to say, have something to contribute to the discussion of classical causal inference. But we have our own motivations, which go beyond just performing a community service. And that is two things. First off, looking for quantumness in places where no one's looked before, and trying to adjudicate between quantum explanations themselves. So let me, let me dig into these. One of the reasons why there are thousands of papers which have built upon Bell's theorem is that it has been understood to advance and make possible new quantum technologies. Most celebrated among them, the clearest link to Bell's theorem, is quantum cryptography, whereby we are now are able to transmit secrets and ensure that they're protected from eavesdropping by the very laws of physics themselves. And it pertains to building a few conceptual leaps on top of Bell's theorem. So here we can take the one class of causal structure that Bell actually looked at, and we say when he saw a signature of quantumness there, look at the technologies that it gave us. So now we can ask, well, what happens if we move to other causal structures? What are the quantum signatures of something not fitting a good classical explanation there? So if we move on to future technologies, such as the quantum internet, which is now being developed, a quantum internet involves entanglement, involves all sorts of quantum systems being distributed over long distances, but it also includes signals, classical information, being transmitted on another layer. So when we try to model that causally, we now have these diagrams which will look a lot closer to the instrumental scenario. Because now we have these common causes, which we hope are quantum common causes, as well as classical causal connections, whereby a message can be sent and that can impact future data. And if we've actually done this work and we're building and laying fiber optic cable, we want to understand have we built something which actually is exploiting quantumness, or have we just spent a lot of money on something which could have been quantumness, but has a bug in it? And so this kind of analysis, where we look for the inequalities which, when violated, are incontrovertible signatures of quantumness, are relevant for building this kind of next generation hardware. If we want to know, is it working, we look to the same types of inequalities, generalizations of Bell inequalities, and when they're violated, we say we have something special. But, in my mind, that's still not the only result, because who knows what future technologies may bring. We've talked about quantum cryptography. We've talked about the quantum internet. But that's just two causal structures. The world of causal structures is unlimited. I can draw any diagram. 
And so when we start to explore exotic causal structures overlooked until now, who knows what future may come? This is why I'm personally excited about that kind of distinction where we're adjudicating between a classical explanation and a quantum explanation. But another direction where we can take generalizing Bell's theorem is deciding between quantum causal structures themselves. So here I've shown a pair of diagrams. One has this extra edge between the nodes which are labeled A and B. And we can perform the same tasks as would be done in standard causal inference, where we're trying to eliminate one suspect and move to another. But here, all of the suspects on the table are quantum suspects. So I can revisit this di diagram that I shared earlier, which was a variety of causal structures, classical causal structures, we've made advances on. What if we can imagine the same causal structures, but make everything quantum now? So instead of inferring about classical unobserved systems from observed information, now we're inferring about the quantum unobserved, and we're adjudicating between quantum causal hypotheses. Now, why is this an exciting field? From an applied perspective, it could be used to design and test next generation quantum hardware. If we're building a quantum computer, for example, we've got lots of circuits which involve magnetic fields, which are supposed to flip different signs in the metal qubits, and there's layers of processes in the architecture, and we might think that we've built one thing, and if it's not working quite right, we want to understand where the bug is. And so we can do a diagnostic uh, on the hardware where we look to see what are the statistics that this circuit is giving rise to. And then we can validate or understand what is the correct real quantum explanation for the statistics that this quantum circuit is giving us, uh, which is immensely valuable for uh, fixing the hardware or knowing how to use it if it has a particular defect. But that's still not the most interesting application as far as I'm concerned. As a foundational theorist, I like to recognize that the universe is quantum. Our understanding has changed. We used to think that a classical explanation was sufficient. But now we understand that Mother Nature herself really requires quantum phenomena to be embedded in it and to explain the world around us. And if we move to this new state of knowledge where we recognize that the world around us is fundamentally quantum, now when we do an experiment and we're trying to understand what's unobserved, we should understand the universe is quantum, therefore the missing explanations should be allowed to be quantum. And indeed, I would argue that in the, the microscopic, perhaps in small biochemical scenarios, we really should be doing quantum causal inference, which is a brand new field of adjudicating between hypotheses where we allow for quantum phenomena to play a role. Now, to recap, these are three directions which explain why quantum physicists get excited about causal inference. One, we get to say something using 50 years of expertise on classical problems. Two, it allows us to identify when we really are seeing special signatures of quantumness, which we can really celebrate and then design technologies around. And three, it allows us to start thinking about model selection between different quantum processes to understand what's really going on. I've claimed that we're going to see new contributions, that as this field grows, the results coming out of quantum theory are going to be making a larger difference. But to make that concrete, I want to tell you a story about a quantum theorist, not a quantum theory result, which has already made a difference in classical causal inference. So this is a story about Kieran Gilligan-Lee. Kieran was a master's student in quantum foundations here at Perimeter. Rob supervised his master's thesis at the Perimeter Scholars International program. He completed his master's here doing causal inference in quantum theory project at Perimeter, completed a PhD at Oxford University in quantum theory, and was then recruited by a healthcare company in the United Kingdom, Babylon Health. They were looking for causal experts for the purpose of automated diagnosis. And so Kieran, as a causal expert, was exactly what they were looking for. Now, what is automated diagnosis? The idea here is, if a patient can tell you their symptoms, a doctor says, oh, if these are your symptoms, here's the medicine I'm going to prescribe to alleviate your symptoms. 
Now, Babylon Health, their mission is to make healthcare more affordable and more accessible. So they were thinking, what if we could bring artificial intelligence to bear on the problem of diagnostics? And they have an app which you can download on your phone and chat with a chatbot, which is essentially the artificial intelligence. You share your symptoms with this computer system, and it tries to figure out what disease you have. And it can then say, you need to go to the emergency room, or you need to see a doctor, or try drinking some soda water. Uh, so here in the background is a video playing where you can sort of see different symptoms being listed and possible explanations and diseases which are associated with them floating around, and the AI is supposed to help decide. Now, Kieran came to Babylon Health and started doing causal analysis. They had a very sophisticated causal model, and he wrote some scripts to try to do calculations whereby if symptoms were presented, Kieran's algorithm was supposed to try to do diagnosis and figure out what disease was causing the symptoms. And there was already an existing uh, algorithm in place at Babylon Health, so Kieran sort of looked at the one that he wrote, and he looked at the one that the company had already been using, and he found that they were performing slightly differently, and he tried to understand what was the difference between his causal analysis and the company's existing causal analysis. And here's the story he tells about the difference in retrospect. So this is an uh, artificial example, but it gets the point across, I think, quite nicely. Imagine that a patient reports that they're experiencing chest pain. So technically, we'd call this angina. There are lots of diseases which can cause chest pain. It could be a heart attack. It could be an infection. It could be a collapsed lung. It might be some unusually rare condition. And the uh, causal model of the artificial intelligence can sort of try to figure out, based on these symptoms, what's going on. And presented with the information of chest pain alone, what would happen is that the existing algorithm at Babylon Health would suggest that the patient consider getting a diagnosis of diabetes. Now, the problem with that is diabetes can't possibly cause chest pain. So if diabetes cannot cause chest pain, if that's not a symptom of diabetes at all, why was this algorithm, which Babylon Health had in use, suggest if all you're doing is reporting chest pain, I suspect that the disease is diabetes. So to understand this, let's peel back and look at the causal layer here. What's really going on is that there are lots of diseases which cause angina, diabetes not among them. However, among the many diseases which do cause chest pain, a lot of them are complications of obesity. So if a patient presents with angina, it updates our knowledge it allows us to infer that there's a much higher likelihood now that the patient might be obese. Now, because there are so many ways that obesity could lead to angina, whether it's an infection, whether it's a heart attack, whether it's one of these rare conditions, none of them are particularly significant, and we would assign fairly small odds for one uh, over the other. However, a patient who is obese, there is a disease which is more strongly associated with obesity than any other, and that, of course, is diabetes. And what Kieran realized is that the artificial intelligence wasn't so much wrong by suggesting diabetes as it was answering the wrong question. Because the truth is, if we look at patients who have chest pain, and we look at their medical charts, and we say, what diseases do we see in their charts? For patients who are reporting chest pain, the disease most often found in their charts, more so than any other, is in fact diabetes. But this is an association, it's not a causation. The question which the automated diagnosis is really meant to answer is a counterfactual question. It's what disease should I treat in order to be most likely successful at reducing the symptoms? This kind of question of what should I treat to reduce the symptoms is very different from what disease does the patient also have if you tell me that they have these symptoms. Now, this speaks to a much deeper truth, which is that artificial intelligence is very good at finding associations. This is what machine learning fundamentally does. It's pattern finding. But we shouldn't rely on pattern finding too much because association is often not the question that we're looking for. And if we don't use causal modeling, we, we tend to make these mistakes. 
Right? Not everything is as simple as saying the reason that there are more firefighters associated with more damage, as Rob told us, well, that's an easy one. But these confusing of causation and correlation are often much more subtle. And it took a quantum theorist, Kiran Gilligan Lee, from Berliner to go to Babylon Health to expose that particular uh, confusion of correlation and causation. And his improvement led to a 30% uh, improvement in the algorithm comparing what was pre-existing. So this is meant to illustrate really two points. One, I've argued that quantum theory will give good contributions. The quantum theorists are poised to make a difference in classical causal inference. But Kieran has already made a difference in classical causal inference. But two, to remind us that causation and correlation are sometimes easily picked apart, but often very difficult to do so. And the language of causal inference, the more that we fold it into artificial intelligence and we supplement artificial intelligence with causal modeling, the more potential we have to draw really relevant conclusions, conclusions which allow us to understand what we should do and not just what is also done at the same time. So uh, at this point, I'll hand it back to Greg. Um, and thank you. Gentlemen, thank you very much. That was a, that was a tremendous journey. And uh, online questions are already streaming in. So for our audience, hashtag PI Live, send them in and we'll uh, keep working through as many as we can. We do have a little bit of time left to do just that. So let me dive right in. Uh, so the first question comes from YouTube and it's, uh, could we just give uh, this to a neural network, give the, uh, all the data to a neural network in these problems and see what comes up. What role does causal inference play in machine learning? Beautiful. So I think this is exactly the, the point that I wanted to end on, which is that if we use machine learning without causation, we get association. We don't get causal conclusions. But we really want causal conclusions. And while association may sometimes be a good proxy for what we're really looking for, Sometimes it's not. And so why settle for association if that's not really what you're looking for? I guess just to add that, um, yeah. I mean, the, the problem of, of developing general purpose artificial intelligence you know, and, and deep learning and neural networks have, have been a big part of, of having you know, general purpose artificial intelligence, much better systems. Um, but if we want something that can really you know, uh, reason about the world, it needs to be able to think about cause and effect. It needs to be able to sort out, you know, what would happen if I intervened in this way, or uh, it needs to be able to think about counterfactuals. You know, this is this is what happened, but what would have happened if something uh, different had occurred? And and that's uh, all uh, because it, it's one of the problems, I guess, in in. Uh, machine learning is, is called uh, transparency, which is, you know, can the system provide you with an explanation of why it made a particular recommendation of what to do or why, why it took a particular action? So one of the nice things uh, that's, that's emphasized by people who, who work in causal inference is that if you incorporate causal inference, uh, then it's much easier to provide those explanations. You know, it, it could be, well, there was this causal model, and the system evaluated what the consequences of different actions would be, and it settled on this action because it was the, the one that had the, the best con consequences. So I, I think a lot of people are, are really uh, excited. I, I, my understanding is that a, a lot of the, the big names in, in AI do see causal inference as, as a component of any good AI system and, and something uh, that we're going to be seeing a lot more of uh, in the near future. And perhaps uh, it could uh, help to achieve more transparency. Great. Uh, here's another question, and very current. Do you know of anyone using causal inference to tackle the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic? Do you think it could be an effective tool in that fight? Yeah. Uh, I, so I get uh, some mailings of sort of all the causal inference papers that are coming out. And uh, over the months, I've been seeing you know, more and more of them that are about uh, COVID data. And uh, yeah, I think um, definitely that is exactly the, the kind of tool you, you want to use. Um, to give you just a sort of one example of a paper that I found particularly interesting, it, it was a paper that noticed uh, the existence of something called Simpson's paradox. So, so my firefighter example was uh, an instance of Simpson's paradox. Um, it noticed uh, this in, in the context of COVID data. So it'll give you a bit of a flavor for you know, why you shouldn't just uh, interpret data directly in terms of associations, which has been uh, the theme here. Uh, so what they saw was that in the early days of the, the pandemic, in something like you know, March and, and uh, maybe the beginning of April, uh, when they compared data coming out of uh, China 
and Italy in terms of uh, case fatality rate. Uh, what they saw was something uh, strange, which was that uh, the uh, case fatality rate was uh, lower in China overall, uh, on average, but it was lower in I Italy in every age group. All right, so if you stratify the data by age group, you found that case in every age group, uh, Italy was doing better than China. But overall, when you averaged all the data, China was doing better. And so that seems strange, but uh, the, the, uh, the resolution is that the age demographics of those two countries are different. Uh, age has an impact on, 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 on mortality, right? So the, the more elderly, the more likely you are that COVID could be fatal. And so uh, what was going on is that the, uh, in China, you have uh, a much more elderly pop uh, sorry, in Italy, you have a much more elderly population. So the statistics are skewed towards the older age groups where you have a higher mortality rate. So when you take the average, you're averaging over people who have higher mortality rates. So your overall mortality rate becomes higher. But in every age category, uh, the, the uh, case fatality rate was less. So you, if you take that into account and you uh, stratify the data by age, you see that uh, the, the, the policy that Italy was doing better uh, than China. But if you didn't have the tools of causal inferences, you, you might not know how to do such an analysis. Great. Uh, OK, this is shifting gears a little bit. This is a question from uh, Arunan. And uh, they ask, do you have any advice for high school and college students who want to pursue an interest in physics? Who would like that one? Well, I can say you, one thing that I found successful is to cold email any physicist you've read their paper. I'm here at Perimeter because Rob had a paper on causal inference in quantum theory. I think it was called Lessons of Machine Learning for uh, Quantum Theory. And I read the paper, and I loved it. Um, and I had some questions on it, and I emailed Rob. And that sort of began a conversation. But then Rob gave a lecture, and I was able to sort of tune in and follow up on that. And I visited Perimeter to have discussions about this. Um, so I would say reach out to people. Never feel embarrassed about expertise. People love getting contacted when you say, hey, I read your paper, yada, 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 I think it's wrong, I think it's good, whatever. The beginning of like, I read your paper, it's good. Let's talk. Rob, do you want to take that one? Or should we move to that? There's yeah, that, that, that's great there. advice. I just uh, second what Ellie said. that. Uh, Particularly if, if, as you know, Ellie mentioned, if you want to have contact with the person, the, the best way to do it is really to engage with with what they're uh, passionate about. Um, so you know, I, I would say also just you know, uh, read a lot and and uh, figure out what what you're passionate about and and uh, sort of go, go deep and and see. There's there's just so much to know. There, there's a lot of great uh, popular science books out there. So I, I sort of recommend going deep into that and and just keep following the trail. Uh, to, to other topics. Great. All right, here's another question from YouTube again. Uh, historically, you, you can, give any, can you give any examples of how techniques from causal inference have made a difference? So uh, beyond, beyond the examples you've given, I, I guess, uh, what fields do you think are most prime to benefit from these techniques going forward? Well, why don't I take the first half of that, and, and then maybe Ellie could take the second half. So uh, one of the examples I like, uh, which, which you can read about in, in Pearl's book, is uh, uh, the history of uh, how uh, we sorted out that smoking does indeed cause uh, lung cancer. So uh, you know, the, the story goes that you know, from the years 1900 to 1950, uh, people noticed that there was this uh, incredible increase in the, in the rates of lung cancer. And they didn't know what had caused it, and a lot had changed in those 50 years. You know, like uh, roads had been tarred. You know, uh, there were automobiles now, so people were uh, inhaling fumes, and, and it really wasn't clear what was the cause. Uh, but in 1950, uh, there was a study done that showed a, a pretty strong association, uh, a statistical correlation between. Uh, you know, they looked at people who had lung cancer, and it noticed that most of them had been smokers, um, and so uh, at the time. Uh, uh, a very famous statistician uh, by the name of R. A. Fisher noted that correlation does not imply causation, and uh, and actually, uh, you know, suggested that you know you, you need to be careful about interpreting that that correlation. And had uh, a competing hypothesis was it was maybe there was a genetic factor that predisposed people both uh, to to be more likely to smoke, and it predisposed them to to develop cancer. 
Uh, and so, so that kind of uh, forced people to have a debate about how do you conclude uh, that it is a causal connection uh, as opposed to a common cause. Uh, and uh, in the end, there was a, a very nice argument uh, by a fellow by the name of Cornfield where he showed that um, the correlation is so strong uh, that you would have to imagine uh, that, that only this genetic factor really could influence whether you became a smoker or not. That, uh, that there, there, there could be very little else that could influence whether you ultimately became a smoker. So the, it just became very implausible that you know, we, we think that you know, like your peer group, for example, can certainly influence you know, whether you become a smoker or not. And, and so the, uh, the, 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 the mathematical strength of those correlations could be leveraged into an argument of the implausibility of that uh, genetic common cause. And that was really that uh, argument by Cornfield was really uh, what persuaded the, the community of uh, medical practitioners that this uh, wasn't just a correlation, but it, it was causal. Uh, and it's, it's a shame in a way that the uh, causal inference didn't come along earlier, because you know, millions of lives could have been saved if, if they had understood how to analyze that data uh, earlier in time. You know, now we, we have some of these tools, but th th those were sort of the, the very beginnings of the field of causal inference. Yeah. As for the question of where causal inference is going to have the most impact, what field is it most pertinent to? The short answer is everywhere. Um, I like to think of causal inference as a discipline which is analogous to a desktop computer. So if computers were originally invented for perhaps one purpose to, to crunch numbers in, in abstract scientific projects, but now everyone has a computer. And what are computers used for? everything. So we've seen that causal inference is universally applicable. It's absolutely applicable to economics, as Rob's explanation regarding impact of education on future wages is. I've seen lots of uh, papers around that theme. I've seen it in social science. We've seen it extremely uh, relevant in medicine. Um, it shows up in advertising. If we're trying to understand, is a particular advertisement effective at uh, leading sales? So we can use causal inference to understand whether it was causation or correlation. Um, it shows up in foreign policy decision making. If we're trying to implement like national government strategies, we can look historically and say, uh, if we implement this policy, will it bring about the long-term results that we want? Um, so everywhere, absolutely everywhere. If I, I just add to that, uh, um, to, to my mind, it, the causal inference tools are, are a bit like statistics. You know, People who, who do an undergraduate degree in lots of different Disciplines will we'll get a course on statistics. Uh, you know, my, my guess is that in, in the future, uh, well, the statistics textbooks will, will be rewritten to incorporate insights from causal inference. But it's it's very conceivable that sort of you know in, in every almost every undergraduate program, you're going to be getting ultimately a course in causal inference to learn some of these tools. Incredible. Well, let's finish with one last question, uh, Dr. Wolf. You referenced Sherlock Holmes. Given uh, his skills as a detective, do you think he would have made a good quantum physicist. Oh, <laughs> I think quantum physics is rife with mysteries that you just can't let go of. So I'm sure that if he encountered the field, he would have stuck around. Ah, Dr. Speckens, Dr. Wolf, thank you so much. It's been an incredible evening. Really appreciate it. Online audience, thank you for joining us. And we look forward to seeing you again next month. Good night, everyone. Thank you, Greg. Thanks, Greg. Good night.